very good afternoon uh, professor uh, neena modi uh, it's very nice to have you here uh, i thank uh, the, dr manoj and his uh, team for giving this excellent opportunity uh, today uh, we are discussing on growth charts we all know growth charts are different the, the standards to identify how children should grow over time and there are many different growth charts available intrauterine postnatal growth charts but accurate growth monitoring of preterm infant is critical in guiding nutrition protocols currently there is no consensus regarding which growth assessment tool is suitable for monitoring uh, postnatal growth at in, in preterm infants there are so many growth charts we have and which has been modified subsequently in the past but monitoring growth and defining growth deficiency in preterm has been a constant challenge for us i'm sure today you are enlightened on which growth uh, charts what are growth charts mm -hmm. and which one to use how to use all that thank you so much and over to you well uh, madam chairman thank you very much i'm not sure that i am going to do that i think i'm going to make things even more complicated for, for everyone so i'm sorry about that but let me start by seeing if i can share my um I need to be able to share my screen. If you could um, enable screen sharing, please. It's on. Yes, to do. They have enabled. They have enabled. Start sharing, madam. No, it still says disabled. Sorry, we need some technical help here. It still says disabled. Okay. It's fine now. Yeah, now we can see. Now, do you see that all right? Sorry, I can't hear you now. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, see. excellent. And can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but let's hope this remote um, uh, process works well. So I'm going to talk, as our chairman uh, has said, about understanding preterm growth charts. And first of all, I'm going to talk about how preterm so-called growth charts, and they are so-called growth charts, are constructed. I'm then going to discuss the implications of using current preterm growth charts in clinical practice. Third, I'm going to describe how preterm babies actually grow and then end with some recommendations and some discussion about next steps. The first thing though is let's get some, um, uh, let's get some uh, uh, definitions clear. By a growth reference is meant a statistical summary of anthropometry by age and sex in a group of infants representative of a particular geogra geographical region at a particular time. Now, the important point to make is that a growth reference, a reference describes how infants grow. In contrast, a growth standard is the same as a growth reference, except that the sample is selected from a healthy population. And there is an assumption that this represents an optimal pattern of growth. So please be aware of the difference between a growth reference and a growth standard. A growth standard is built on the assumption that this represents an optimal pattern of growth. A growth reference is simply a description. And of course, you know about the lines. These are the median with symmetrical centiles above and below, either the third, 10th, 25th below, it's an equivalent above um, all standard deviation spacings. Now, when we use the term preterm growth charts, these are constructed using either birth, uh, fetal weight estimates or birth weights of babies born at different gestational ages. And it's, that's another really important point. They are not, they are not longitudinal, they are not charts which depict the longitudinal growth of preterm babies. They are constructed either using fetal weight estimates or cross-sectional birth weights. Therefore, they are really largely birth weight charts. They are not growth charts. And of course, 
And despite this, neonatal management is very heavily influenced by preterm so-called growth charts. And as our uh, chair has said, a range of these exist around the world. Now these charts inevitably depict a trajectory leading to the weight of a baby born at full term. And by the way, I'm going to focus on weight. I'm not going, to, because time is tight, I'm not going to talk about length and head circumference. I'm only going to talk about weight. So preterm charts are birth or fetal measurement charts. They don't depict longitudinal postnatal growth and they converge, as you can see in this UK WHO preterm chart, they converge with full-term baby measurements at 40 weeks uh, post-menstrual age. Okay, very important points, these. And the Fenton charts are equivalent. I don't know what charts you use in, in India, but it'd be very good to know whether uh, which charts you use and how they were constructed. But if birth weight, a birth weight chart is used as a longitudinal growth chart, then, and you follow that chart, then you will try and force a preterm baby to reach the weight of a baby born at full term by 40 weeks postmenstrual age. And this presents some very problematic views. So let's go through these one by one. First of all, we often hear this phrase that a preterm baby should grow like a fetus. And in other words, reach the size of a baby born at full term by 40 weeks postmenstrual age. I find that a very difficult statement indeed. It's a statement that appears to have arisen from an opinion voiced in 1977, a very long time ago, by the American Academy of Pediatrics. They acknowledged at the time that this was not based on evidence. The second problematic prevalent view is that weight below the 10th centile at term or a weight Z score below minus 1.3 at around about term constitute so-called postnatal growth restriction or postnatal growth, growth failure. Now I challenge this view because these terms imply suboptimal health status at term um, and they give credence to exhortations to pursue so-called aggressive nutritional practices. I hate the phrase aggressive nutrition. I find it extremely unhelpful. I don't think we should be aggressive about anything. And these so-called aggressive nutritional practices promote rapid weight gain. And I'll come back to the problem about rapid weight gain in a moment. And then there is this view that faster weight gain is always better weight gain. Now, as neonatologists, we know this is just not true. If you take the full-term healthy uh, newborn baby who is breastfed, that baby will grow more slowly than a formula-fed baby. We're not saying formula feeding is better. We're saying breastfeeding is better. So I'm afraid the view that faster weight gain is better weight gain is a very, very, very problematic statement. I will also remind you that there has not been a single clinical trial to date that has deliberately targeted third tri rapid, more rapid third trimester weight gain and shown a sustained benefit for neurodevelopment. And Tanis Fenton and colleagues just last year published a very nice paper showing that anthropometry at full term in preterm babies is not predictive of later neurodevelopmental outcome. So I would challenge the view that in our preterm babies, faster weight gain is always better weight gain. I'm afraid that does not stand up to scrutiny. Now, what are the implications of using these birth weight charts as growth charts, which is what we all tend to do? Well, in pediatric practice, the ideal pattern of weight gain re reflects um, at growth in healthy children. But in preterm babies, this conceptual framework is very problematic because preterm birth is an inherently an abnormal phenomenon. Preterm babies are born because something has gone wrong with the pregnancy. And this is why babies born preterm generally weigh less than an equivalent fetus who remains in utero. So almost all preterm babies have suffered some form of some degree of intrauterine growth restriction. Um, and therefore using an arbitrary cutoff, a binary cutoff saying this preterm baby is growth restricted and this preterm baby is not, does not make sense. Almost all preterm babies have suffered some degree of intrauterine growth restriction. And so therefore, example, at 28 to 32 weeks gestation, the 50th centile here, for birth weight compares approximately with the 10th centile for fetal weight. And the optimal pattern of postnatal growth, in other words, the pattern of weight gain 
third trimester weight gain after preterm birth that leads to the best long-term outcomes is unknown. If you attempt to mimic the pattern of intrauterine growth that's depicted by birth, uh, these, these preterm growth charts, that risks promoting rapid weight gain. So let me show you what happens in practice. Here are uh, Here it is a, a set of growth curves. On the y-axis, we have weight. On the x-axis, we have postmenstrual age. The solid lines are estimated fetal weights, and you will see that they are higher than actual birth weight reference ranges, which are the dotted lines. And here we have uh, this red dot depicts a hypothetical baby born at 28 weeks gestation. Now, do you want to achieve the weight that this baby would have had if she or he had remained in utero? Or do you want to achieve the weight velocity that this baby would have had in utero? In the first case, weight gain will be rapid and it will exceed fetal weight velocity so that the baby achieves at or before term the weight of a baby born at term or born at a more mature gestational age. So that will be your, um, your, your weight trajectory, this red line or this red line. However, if you want to follow the weight velocity, then the baby will inevitably weigh less at term than a full term count part because they will follow this trajectory depicted by the blue line. And one of a very, very fundamental problem in preterm medicine is that some people follow the red lines, some people believe it's safer to follow the blue lines. We just do not know which is going to lead to the optimum outcome. And of course, there is a danger of promoting more rapid growth because we have now over eight decades of research in every species studies, including humans, that shows a very, very clear relationship between accelerated postnatal weight gain especially after a period of growth restriction, which is the situation for our preterm babies, and greater risk of age-related chronic diseases and a shorter lifespan. And you will, um, uh, Casey Crump, who has published a lot of work in this area, did a very nice summary review, which was published in the Neonatal Update 2020 special edition of Early Human Development in November, and shows these increased odds ratios for pretty much every chronic non-communicable disease you could think of, including um, a reduction in all-cause mortality, a, a, a greater risk of all-cause mortality, sorry, a, a reduction in longevity in preterm babies. And so we should really consider the possibility that forcing more rapid early weight gain might exacerbate these risks. Now, India is already suffering a huge exponential increase in chronic non-communicable diseases. And as scientists who strive to practice evidence-based medicine, Yes, we accept that too slow weight gain is bad, but we also need to accept that too rapid weight gain may also be bad for our preterm babies. And somewhere in the middle of too slow and too fast is going to be the optimum weight, uh, weight velocity. So how do healthy preterm babies actually grow? Well, for this, I refer you to um, a paper that we published last year in Lancet Child and Adolescent Health, um, this was uh, from uh, my colleagues and I, and the title was Birth Rate and Patterns of Postnatal Weight Gain in Very and Extremely Preterm Babies in England and Wales. This was a whole population cohort study spanning a 12 year period. And one of our aims was to describe um, weight gain in relation to healthy survival and major morbidity. We had other gain, uh, I'm sorry, other aims. There isn't time to talk about all of them. I'm going to focus on on um, uh, the, the pattern of postnatal weight gain in relation to healthy survival and in relation to babies with major morbidities. So these were whole population data from our UK National Neonatal Research Database. We included every single very preterm baby admitted to an NHS neonatal unit. So it was complete and whole population. And we evaluated longitudinal weights for babies surviving to 36 post weeks menstrual age with and without major morbidities. This shows you the pattern of weight gain in very preterm babies surviving without major morbidities. So they had no ROP, BPD, major uh, brain injury, retinopathy of prematurity. They had healthy survival. The colored lines depict babies of different gestational ages. So the brown lines are babies born at 23 weeks gestation and the dark blue line represent babies born at 31 weeks gestation um, and all the other gestational ages in between. Um, on the right, you have girls. On the left, you have boys. 
you can also see this weight velocity fan. And you can see that after an initial weight loss, which we expect because we lose about 10%, babies lose about 10% of body water after birth, they then followed a very consistent weight velocity. Weight velocity in all gestational age groups stabilized um, uh, at around uh, 34 weeks postmenstrual age at between 16 to 25 grams per day. And these lines were parallel. And weight at term is consistently below birth weight center. So what we're seeing here is consistent postnatal weight velocity, consistent postnatal weight velocity. What we also saw that postnatal weight gain differs in babies who are going to go on to develop major morbidities or who are going to survive without major morbidities. And I suggest you focus primarily on this last panel, intact survival, but essentially the blue lines depict babies who survived or survived without these major morbidities, BPD, neck, severe brain injury and rock. But this last panel shows intact survival, the blue lines versus babies who, who, who died. And you can see that babies who are going to go on to develop a major morbidity or to die, their weight trajectory differs from those who have healthy survival from a very early stage, showing in fact, uh, and the other thing that we showed was that babies who grow on to have major morbidities have a birth weight centile that is lower than babies who go on to have intact survival, showing what we all know, but showing very nicely that growth restriction increases your risk of not surviving or having an adverse outcome. Um, so the key summary points from this paper are that trajectories of weight gain diverged from shortly after birth between infants who survived or went on to die and with intact and non-intact survival. And in babies who survived without major morbidity, after that initial period of weight loss, weight gain stabilized along parallel centile lines in all gestational age groups. And as I said earlier, babies who would go on to develop a major morbidity had a lower birth weight Z score than those who did not develop these morbidities and those who survived. And at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, weight in babies without major morbidities was lower than birth centile um, by about minus 1.8 Z score for babies born at 23 weeks gestation and about minus 1.4 for babies born at 31 weeks gestation. Now, there are other data as well out there, and I'm going to very briefly refer to these. So this is the intergrowth study about which I'm very often asked. This was funded by the World Health Organization. It was meant to be a study of intrauterine growth, but they extended it to try and get some information about postnatal growth in very preterm babies. This has very little re relevance for us as neonatologists because the follow-up study included only 201 preterm infants, and of these, only 28 babies were born below 34 weeks gestation. So I'm afraid the intergrowth study does not have relevance for us as neonatologists looking after babies born below 34 weeks gestation. But one of the interesting things about the intergrowth study is that it did show convergence by five years to infants born at full term, uh, regardless of, of uh, the status of these babies. There are other studies from around the world, studies from the United States, from Italy, for example, also show that preterm infants gain in weight along a lower mean centile. Um, I've mentioned the intergrowth study already, but collectively these studies include diverse preterm populations and highly variable nutrient intakes. But the consistency of the finding that weight velocity is very consistent, very much the same, regardless of which study you look at, is a very interesting finding. And this suggests that postnatal weight gain in the third trimester follows a predetermined weight velocity, which of course is the case throughout childhood. As pediatricians, we know that children follow a, a, a velocity trajectory that is very, very consistent from child to, to child. So this, is, this fits with what we know as pediatricians. So to summarize, what is optimal weight gain for a baby born very preterm? Well, we just don't know. And I would say to the younger members of the audience, if your teacher tells you this is optimum weight gain, challenge them, because I'm afraid we just don't know. 
I would also say that despite enormous variation in nutritional support for very preterm babies, the overwhelming majority have a final adult height and weight within the normal population range. So we can reassure our parents that so long as they are not gaining weight too quickly, and so long as they're not gaining weight too slowly, their adult height and weight should be within the normal population range for full-term babies. So finally to end, what are practice recommendations? First of all, please remember that current preterm so-called growth charts are birth measurement charts. They do not depict longitudinal growth. They help us plot change. They help us visualize what's happening to a baby. They are a reference. Please do not use them as a standard. If a preterm baby is healthy and well, receiving at least 200 mils per kilo per day of own mother's breast milk, gaining at weight along a steady velocity and not dropping in centiles, please be reassured, be happy. Do not try and force a preterm baby through so-called aggressive feeding to reach the weight of a full-term baby at term, because that may actually be very harmful for the baby. I'm going to end there, say thank you very much. If you're interested in finding out more about the science of newborn care, please do join us at the Neonatal Update 2022, which will be held from the 28th of November to December the 2nd. Registration is now open. Please just go to Neonatal Update. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Oh. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nina Modi, for your excellent presentation, for throwing light on uh, what is a normal growth pattern in preterm babies, the different growth charts, which one should we follow, and a little bit on the intergrowth 21, and weight gain along the preterm babies, growth weight along the lower mean centiles, and optimal growth of very preterm babies. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, any questions? Or shall we have a... a Get the questions in the chat box. We have the access. Okay. Uh, while waiting for that, I have a question to you. Uh, so you know that in in our country, so in our developing countries, we have a lot of EUGR babies. So in that situation, this is also one of the questions asked by one of our colleagues, which growth chart to use sorry i beg your pardon i didn't hear your first the first part of your question in our country we uh, have yeah uh, i'll repeat it uh eugr babies extra uterine growth restriction these babies are more more of sga babies small for gestational age babies and eugr babies so in that situation which growth chart to use postnatally well I, I will repeat what i said earlier all preterm babies are growth restricted, but the only issue is the extent to which they are growth restricted. And some babies have clearly suffered intrauterine, all preterm babies have suffered intrauterine growth restriction. Now, if we manage our babies well as neonatologists, they should not suffer extrauterine growth restriction. And what do I mean by manage our babies well? So extremely preterm babies, Though by that I mean babies born below 29 weeks gestation, should have early or immediate parental nutrition plus immediate introduction of mother's own milk feeds. We should then increase mother's own milk feeds as tolerated up to a volume of 30 mils per kilo per day. And a primary goal should be to feed babies, extremely preterm babies, with their own uh, mother's breast milk. Uh, that should be our primary goal, not worrying about what rate of weight gain they have, but actually feeding their own mother's breast milk, reducing the duration of dependence on parental nutrition and transitioning them to full mother's breast milk feeds as quickly as they will tolerate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, you have just mentioned that um, it, despite uh, wide variation in the nutritional practices, uh, they seem to, these premature babies seem to fall, fall, follow a same growth pattern, a few centiles below the normal growth pattern. 
So in this regard, what is the role of uh, fortification? What is the role of any post-discharge uh, um, special formulas? Or what is, I mean, is there any need for us to practice them? Or we should just, you know, accept their weights uh, with the exclusive breastfeeding and um, and then just, you know, see, because most of them seem to catch up uh, the same height and weight when they become, you know, adults. Thank you very, thank you very much. So the first thing I will say is there's absolutely no need for post-discharge formulas. This is just a way for the formula companies to make money. Please do not ask your parents to waste their money on post-discharge formulas. Throw them away. They are, they are, they, they are not needed. What we really should be promoting is full breastfeeding. And here I would say that the onus for promoting breastfeeding should fall on both men and women. At the moment, of course, a woman is a mother who will breastfeed, but a mother should not take um, a career progression gap or a pay gap because she takes time off work to breastfeed. And our poorest mothers very often cannot afford to stop work um, to breastfeed. So I do think that we are unfair to mothers if we impose the challenge of breastfeeding babies without supporting them to get good parental leave and without supporting them to get good paid parental leave. Because if we don't do that, then we are really disadvantaging them and we're disadvantaging the opportunity for them to breastfeed their babies. The second point about fortification is that there is a role for fortification, but not routine fortification. Um, some babies may need fortif fortification, but very, very few, if they are being fed an adequate volume of their own mother's milk, and particularly if we transition them to suck breastfeeding, um, so that the baby is suckling directly from the breast. And as you know, most preterm babies will start to be able to suckle at the breast around 33, 34 weeks postmenstrual age, and we should encourage that support that and help them to transition so that they are regulating their own intake. Before the time that they can suckle at the breast, uh, we should certainly be feeding them at least at a volume of 200 mils per kilo of own mother's milk. Now, if their weight velocity declines on that sort of, despite that sort of volume of intake, and if they are dropping in centiles, then the first thing to do as, as good pediatricians is to make sure that they don't have any intercurrent, other intercurrent illness. Because for example, if they have a urinary tract infection, they may not, they may not put on weight well, even though you're feeding them 200 mils per kilo of milk. And there's no point giving them 45. What you need to do is treat the urinary tract infection or whatever else is the, is the, is the problem with them. The other very common reason for babies not gaining weight well, for very preterm babies not gaining weight well, is chronic sodium insufficiency because of course, human milk, breast milk is low in sodium content. So if they're getting 200 mils per kilo per day of mother's milk and weight velocity is declining and they are otherwise well, just give them an oral sodium supplement of one to two millimoles per kilo per day and see what happens. If despite that, their weight velocity is still slow, they are dropping in centiles and their blood urea is low, and by low, I mean less than 1.2 millimoles per liter, then and then only would I consider uh, adding in uh, a macronutrient fortifying. By macronutrient, I mean adding added protein carbo and carbohydrate. So I hope that's that's helpful. Answer the question. Any other questions? Um, well said, Dr. Modi. Uh, Arun from New Zealand. Hi, Arun. Yes. Uh, so, you know, we have been doing some work on this early aggressive nutritional uh, on preterm babies. We probably have seen some of our uh, work uh, findings. One of the things that has come out is repeating syndrome. Uh, it's, it's a new, new concept for many people, but in, in you know, India would have known because we used to have a lot of underage children we still have, and we start doing some early aggressive feeding get into problems like that. We are able to see that now in a newborn baby. So it's said that very well, but how do you then, if you're talking about starting TPN, 
you're obviously against the aggressive or high protein uh, sort of a feeding. Is that what you're getting at? And have you noted any of these issues with refeeding problems that uh, we are, we were not aware of so far? Yeah, th th thank you very much. And it's good to see you. Um, I, I, yes, it's very, it's a very topical issue, this so-called refeeding syndrome. Um, also, so, uh, also dumped, some, some, sometimes people feel that they're witnessing dumping syndrome as well. Refeeding syndrome can, can, is not inevitable. Um, one of the things I always say at this point is don't forget that we should be giving babies routine, very preterm babies, extremely preterm babies, routine phosphate supplements from very early on. That may well help prevent against so-called refeeding syndrome. And the other uh, point is that we should not be, um, we should be starting feeding early. One of the things that you, that I think predisposes to refeeding syndrome is to delay the introduction of enteral feeds, by which point the baby's enteric mucosa may have, um, may have suffered, may have been compromised. Um, don't forget, we need substrate in our guts. Babies need substrate in their guts in order for their gastrointestinal tracts to grow. So we should certainly be giving babies colostrum immediately, absolutely immediately, within as soon as we can get colostrum from mum, as soon as the baby's um, coming to our neonatal intensive care units. We then know that we should, we should feed babies enterally at a rate at which they tolerate. Clearly, if the baby's vomiting or got abdominal distension, they're not going to increase feeds. But if they're otherwise well, we should be going up at a rate of uh, between 15 and 30 mils per kilo per day. Now, many neonatologists don't do this, and many babies don't tolerate these rates. So um, if you go up more slowly and then suddenly increase your feeds, you're much more likely to see a refeeding syndrome. So I would say maintain the integrity of the gastrointestinal mucosa by starting feeds early and continuing, even at a, a low rate if the baby's not tolerating an increase, but increasing if the baby is tolerated, and start with phosphate supplements straight away as soon as your baby's on at least 10 mils per kilo per day of milk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions from audience? Tanjali. Yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, that was a wonderful lecture and very nice to hear from you. Ma'am, uh, just a question like, uh, how do you think we need to kind of define EUGR? Like, based on the date of discharge or at the time of discharge, or is there a particular time when you want to measure it? And what do you want to measure to say that it is EUGR? You know, there are so a lot I, of controversies regarding that. Thank you. I would drop the term extra uterine growth restriction. I think it's extremely unhelpful. So I would drop it. I would stick with the term faltering of weight gain, um, growth faltering, which is, I think, a good pediatric term. And I would just define faltering weight if a baby after the period of immediate postnatal weight loss, so once they regain their birth weight, if their weight velocity falls below the expected for that gestational age group, you can find those um, median weight velocities in our paper, in our Lancet paper. But you, if, you, if you don't want to remember those or don't want to, to think about actual figures, then define it as a baby who is dropping off in centiles, who is not following a consistent centile, um, regardless of what that centile would, would be. So that's how I would recommend you define faltering in weight gain, and I would drop the term extra uterine growth restriction or growth retardation completely. It is not helpful. And parents find it particularly distressing. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, any other questions in the chat box also? Yeah. One more question. Can you come? Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, uh, ma is she audible? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, ma'am, uh, you said that uh, in some babies you can give a fortification. Like, what would you consider the threshold for gestation or birth weight in which we should start fortification uh, as soon as? Uh, None. None. There should be no threshold based on birth weight, weight or gestational age. Um, I, I, as I said earlier, I would only use fortification if one, the baby is otherwise healthy, two, 
is already getting at least 200 mils per kilo of O mother's milk. Three, you have ruled out chronic sodium deficiency. And four, the blood urea nitrogen is less than 1.2 millimoles per liter. That's the point at which I would consider using fortification, macronutrient fortification. Because, and I say macronutrient fortification, I'm not talking about giving a phosphate supplement or vitamin supplements, which all very preterm babies should have. I'm talking about uh, protein carbohydrate fortification. Thank you so much, Mark. Any other questions? Uh, in the chat box, can we have access? No, no. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, madam. It is. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you much. very much indeed. Have a good conference. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, madam.